Hello, everybody. I'm Bino Friedman. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me here today. Uh, I would normally love to be there in person. Unfortunately, uh, I can't come this time because of a family celebration. So uh, I'm sending you this video instead to update you on our progress. So without further ado, I will share my screen and tell you a little bit more about what we're doing in the lab. The title of my talk today is Using Human Pluripotent Stem Cells to Develop New Treatments for Cystinosis. And this is the big picture of the pluripotent stem cell field, why we're all very excited about it. These guys over here on the right are the stars of the show, the pluripotent stem cells, sometimes called IPS cells. And what's unique about these cells is that they represent a very early stage in embryonic development before any of the organs have formed. And they can actually turn into an entire organism given the right conditions. Now, the other magical part of this is that until recently, we weren't able to make these cells from human beings, but uh, we've now, through the power of science, learned how to take adult cells, and these can be derived from something as humble as a urine sample, and reprogram them, essentially turning back the clock and turning these into these pluripotent stem cells. And now we can take the pluripotent stem cells and coax them into turning into little mini organs in a dish for the purposes of trying out new therapeutics, uh, or push them even further along to turn into grafts that could potentially be transplanted back into the original donor of the cells. So for cystinosis sponsored by the CRF, uh, we have now generated a large bank or a biobank of IPS cells from patients with cystinosis or with mutations that cause cystinosis uh, that were introduced by genome editing. And uh, you can see here that we've derived from about 14 patients, uh, many of whom are likely in this room, uh, a set of IPS cell lines that represent 175 vials that are frozen down in our laboratory. And the way we generate these cells is we send a package out to individuals who would wish to contribute a urine sample. And this is then shipped back to us and we derive the urinary cells from the package and then subsequently uh, change those into IPS cells and ultimately into other lineages such as the kidney organoids that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Uh, this is Max here on the left modeling our Biobank, you can see it's coming out of the liquid nitrogen. That's where all these little vials, these little tubes of cells are stored. So what does it look like? Well, the IPS cells from patients with cystinosis look very similar to uh, patients that don't have cystinosis. They're essentially indistinguishable looking at them. So under the normal growth conditions, these IPS cells are just fine. But when we look a little bit deeper at the cells, uh, we see that they are accumulating high levels of cysteine within the IPS cells uh, when they have these cystinosin mutations, which normally doesn't happen in the control cells, but it doesn't seem to be affecting them under these conditions. Now we've recently developed new conditions where the cells grow in the presence of a stressful condition. And this causes them to accumulate the cysteine to extreme levels. Uh, so here they're accumulating 150 times as much cysteine in the cystinosin uh, cell lines compared to the controls under the same conditions. And under these conditions, cysteine accumulation seems to make the cells sick. So normally uh, with cystinosin present, the cells can handle this stress condition, but uh, when they have the mutations, we see a loss of viability in the cells, indicating the cells are actually getting sick. And this is really the first time we're able to see uh, what we think looks like cystinosis in a Petri dish, uh, a, an effect on the cell's health under this condition. So we're excited by this, by this recent development. And what's also exciting about this is that we can reverse the impact of these stress treatments by treating the cells with increasing doses of cysteine. 
So this is our uh, standard gold uh, standard therapy for patients who have cystinosis, and it seems to be helping the cells as well. And while cysteamine is not a perfect drug, I think this bodes well for the prospects of using this system to test out other types of treatments that are in development. So that was all in the pluripotent stem cells before they've turned into any specific type of organ. Uh, but in the lab, we're very interested in the kidneys, which are of course very vulnerable uh, in cystinosis. And many years ago now, we've developed a technique to change iPS cells into what we call mini kidneys or mini kidney organoids. And these are some of the images here on the right of the kidney organoids compared to kidney tissue. Uh, and you can see that many of the cell types that are present uh, in the tissue are also present in the organoids in these really beautiful arrangements that uh, are almost indistinguishable when you look at them structurally uh, under the microscope from the actual tissue. So these cells are trying to make these complex filter units that we see in the body in the kidneys called nephrons, where blood flows in and uh, goes through this nest of uh, blood vessels and uh, then is perfused through this layer of filtering cells called podocytes to form the urine. So uh, we've now generated these mini kidneys from cystinosin uh, iPS cells compared to the control iPS cells. And what we see is that our, our cystinosis iPS cells can generate very beautiful kidney organoids uh, with podocytes connecting down to proximal tubules and then distal tubules in this intricate arrangement characteristic of kidney tissue. And this actually is very similar to control iPS cells and their ability to generate these structures. Uh, the kidney organoids also express megalin, which is an important receptor in the kidneys and is thought to be defective as cystinosis advances and you get an onset of Fanconi syndrome. But so far in the organoids, we aren't seeing any evidence of the Fanconi syndrome under the standard uh, growth conditions. However, we do, just as in the iPS cells, we do see accumulation of cysteine in the kidney organoids. And this is a clue that we may be able to tease out uh, that nephropathy phenotype as we continue to investigate. So our goal here is really to understand the effects of cystinosis on the kidneys and learn how to treat the vulnerable proximal tubular cells uh, for which we currently don't have uh, adequate treatments to prevent the need for transplantation. And one of the treatments that we're working on is to develop a gene therapy that will restore cystinosin into these tubular epithelial cells. And uh, this is an example here on the left. This is in the undifferentiated iPS cells before they turn into kidney. These little red, these little red cells here have been gene edited and are carrying a new copy of cystinosin uh, along with them as they grow. And uh, on the, in the middle here is a kidney organoid where we performed a similar experiment. And when you can see, we can achieve gene editing in the organoids as indicated by the presence of these red cells and even within the tubular regions uh, of the organoid. And on the far right, what we're seeing is, is a protein sample from control cells before they've been treated with the gene therapy uh, versus uh, cells that were treated, treated with the gene therapy on the right. And this band here is actually the cystinosin protein that's being expressed and restored into those cells. So we can see at the molecular level that indeed we are restoring cystinosin uh, at levels where it wasn't detectable previously. So where all this is hopefully leading for us is to develop really a next generation transplantation therapy uh, for cystinosis and for the nephropathy aspects of it, where we could take cells from a patient and take them all the way into a graft uh, that could then be transplanted back into that original uh, donor individual. And that's what we're uh, showing here. Uh, in, in this case, we're taking human iPS cells from a cystinosis patient 
And instead of implanting them into the patient, which at this stage would be premature, uh, we're implanting them into a mouse. And the mouse, we're putting it into the mouse kidney as a graft just underneath uh, the kidney capsule. So it's snuggled up right next to the mouse kidney tissue. And remarkably, what, the, what happens under this situation is that the mouse blood vessels uh, grow out of the mouse kidney, and they're shown here in the green, and they integrate with the human filtering cells, the human podocytes, which are shown here in the red, and they form structures that look like that glomerulus filtration unit, uh, which I showed you earlier. And you can see these here as you go through, you have these green blood vessels and they are surrounded by these red filtering cells. Uh, and it is really beginning to look like, uh, like kidney tissue under these circumstances. And here's another example of one of these, uh, what we call neoglomeruli, where uh, you have human filtering cells that have become invaded by blood bearing mouse uh, blood vessel cells. And uh, this is leading us towards a new paradigm for transplant, whereas in the past, we've had to take uh, kidneys from a donor who was not a perfect match, even though they may say it's a perfect match, but it's not a true perfect match because it's a different individual. And this would require immunosuppression for the life of the graft, and you'd have to wait for this transplant. In the new paradigm, we're hoping that we could generate uh, autologous grafts from a person's own body going through an iPS cell intermediate and by performing gene editing in those iPS cells to restore cystinosin and then producing a functional graft, uh, we would be able to restore kidney function uh, and stave off the need for kidney transplantation. So uh, in conclusion, I think that the uh, system, the iPS cells can be used for a variety of different applications at different stages of therapy development, ranging from uh, very broad screens, looking at many different molecules, searching for the needle in the haystack or the silver bullet, uh, all the way to developing grafts that could actually be transplanted uh, back into an individual uh, if we can demonstrate that they are both safe and efficacious. So, the bottom line is that a, a discarded urine sample can be the start of something big. And if you wanna contribute, uh, please let us know. You can reach out to me directly. Uh, our study is still open. Uh, we've believed that cystinosis pluripotent stem cells are a new way to test therapies and that gene editing uh, may be one of those therapy approaches and that grafts in animals are beginning to show promising signs of becoming functional. And that was uh, quite a pleasant surprise that emerged from all of this research. I wanted to, uh, again, thank the foundation without which none of this would be possible. They've really uh, taken us into a very interesting and new area that we're very excited about, as well as uh, everybody in the laboratory uh, and our collaborators at UCSD who are critical for measuring the cysteine levels in our cells and organoids. And thank everybody in the audience, especially if you've contributed cells uh, to the study, we very much appreciate you and uh, we have your cells. So thank you.